Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. You know, I love to talk about books that make me happy, books that are doing amazing things, but you know, not every book is great. Some books are not, some books are disappointing, some books are really not for me. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about my 24 worst books of 2022. Now here's my disclaimer. If you liked any of the books on my worst of the year list, that's great. I'm happy for you. Honestly, there's a few books on this list that I know are on the best of the year lists of some of my friends, and we're still friends. We can have different taste in books, different perspectives on books. It's fine. I will say there's a lot more to talk about this year than I have had to talk about in previous years. I think this year I was trying to be very honest with my ratings and part of what that meant for me was not giving too much credit to a book for what it was trying to do when it didn't actually accomplish that thing for me. I hope that makes sense. So here's what we're going to do. I have placed these in descending order from just disappointing or not for me to truly the worst things that I read this year and we're gonna go in order. So we're gonna start with things like that I would maybe give two stars to where I didn't think it was completely awful but there were particular things that I didn't like about it or things that really didn't work for me and then we're gonna end up at my few one stars at the very end of this video with the things that I just hated a lot. So you're welcome. <laughs> I know already this is going to be a controversial list, and if I mention one of your faves, I'm sorry. Just, you know, skip past it for your own mental health. It You can still love it. You can love it enough for people like me to not. That's fine. All right, so we're going to start with number 24. I don't have all of these numbered, so I'm not going to tell you the numbers for all of them. Number 24 is The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. I know there are people who really like this. I have very much enjoyed other books by Alex E. Harrow, but she is just hit and miss for me. This is a book that I thought was far too long, and I liked what it was trying to do, but I think it kind of failed at some of what it was attempting. It seems to be a feminist book that's trying to comment on the state of marginalized people, but ends up just centering white feminist ideas anyway. And it, it that part of it didn't work for me. For me, the best part of this book was this fraught sister relationship. But unfortunately, that was such a small part of the book compared to everything else, that it wasn't enough for me to love it. I didn't hate it, but it was a big disappointment because I went in with very high expectations and they just weren't met. The uh, next is another book that I was so disappointed by because I had such high hopes, but it just did not give me what I wanted. This is Savvy Sheldon Feels Good as Hell by Taj McCoy. Listen, y'all, I was like, yes, a plus size romance that's supposed to be body positive with this like beautiful fat black woman on the cover like yes I love it this this is gonna be amazing it it was not it was not either of those things number one it wasn't a romance it was definitely women's fiction the romance was a very small part of the story and I didn't care about the romance. I mean, technically, I guess there's an HEA, but really this was about the personal growth of our main character. So part one is it didn't actually give me a romance. The marketing was a problem. The second part of it is that this is not really body positive. This book has so much graphic content about weight loss and calorie counting and exercising for weight loss. And honestly, as somebody who has a history of certain kinds of disordered eating like orthorexia, I found it to be quite triggering. And that is not a thing I normally say about books that deal with this, but it was a lot. And yeah, again, the best part of this book was the female friend group. I didn't care for the romance. I did not love all of the inclusion of the dieting stuff. It was like heavy diet culture. Didn't give me what I was sold. And and I'm and it was a big disappointment. Next is a book that I know one of my dear friends loved and it is one of her favorite books of the year. So I'm sorry, Tamara. Um, but I did not like The Woman in the Library by Sulari Gentle. 
Listen, this is the year that I've come to realize that sometimes me and Mara, even though we are friends, have very different taste in what we enjoy in certain genres like mystery and romance. I feel like that's where our tastes tend to diverge the most. And I think this is a great example of this. This book bored me to tears. I struggled to get through it. Honestly, if Mara hadn't hyped it up so much, I probably would have just DNF'd it. But I was like, she loves this book so much. There must be something that I'm gonna love from this too. And I got to the end and I was like, no, this was a miserable reading experience. I didn't like any of the characters. I didn't care about the mystery plot until very late in the book and it wasn't enough to save it for me. Uh, I also found all of the, because it's told in like multiple sort of timelines and part of it is told through editorial notes, which I found irritating and pedantic, so I didn't enjoy that. I, it just, it, I wasn't a fan. I am so glad that other people have loved this book. I wanted to, but it was not for me. Next is another kind of mystery thriller that I didn't enjoy. This is Like a Sister by Kelly Garrett. This too was just disappointing to me because I wanted to like it and it had bits and pieces of things that I could have liked, but ultimately there were plot holes that didn't make a lot of sense. There were things about the writing style that I didn't get on with and I, I thought the ending was kind of dumb. I, it came out of left field. I didn't think it made any sense, the like twist ending. I, I just, I didn't like it very much. It's not the worst. I didn't hate it. I gave it two stars, but I wanted a lot more from it. <sighs> Some people have loved it though. So, you know, like if you're new to the mystery genre, maybe this will work for you, but I, it, it was, it was not for me. And here is another one where I thought that the best parts of it were the complicated family dynamics with her and her father and her stepsister. That was the best part of the book to me, but it wasn't the bulk of the book. So yeah, all of these books that are disappointments have things that I like in them and things that they were trying to do, but there was just so much else in it that really didn't work for me. It it kind of fell flat. Next is a book that I read for a vlog project where I was reading books that have been made popular through TikTok and books that were recommended to me. This book is The Charmed Wife by Olga Grushin. This is another controversial take because I know there are people who really liked it. I was not a fan. This is kind of a weird Cinderella retelling. I'm actually gonna read a little bit from my Goodreads review for this one because I think it summarizes it a little more nicely. What if many years and two children into marriage, Cinderella wanted her husband dead? This book plays on fairy tales, but in a trippy way that sometimes doesn't know what it wants to be. Yeah. Cinderella in part one was painfully bland and naive with lengthy interludes about her mice that were kind of insufferable. I hated these. I don't understand why we got all these long interludes with her mice speaking. I did not care about them. It was annoying to read. Part two was better, but ends up getting very didactic and on the nose. Plus we have lots of fat phobia, vilification of women preyed on by the main character's husband as if they're at fault for his infidelity. And then we also have the use of a slur for Romani people alongside a fetishized portrayal of them. And then I said, in some ways this feels like tepid white feminism that's mostly concerned with the problems of the privileged. And I had a hard time caring. There you go. <laughs> I feel like I was more eloquent in my Goodreads review than I would be now. I read this close to the beginning of the year, but I don't have fond memories of the experience of reading that book. And if I can find it, I'll link the vlog up above if you want to see my reaction in real time. <sighs> Next up is another book that was just a big disappointment for me. I was hoping for a lot better. This is By the Book by Jasmine Guillory. Now I'm going to say that I have a mixed relationship to Jasmine Guillory's books. They are very hit and miss for me. There's like two books I've read from her that I've loved and then all the other things I've read from her has either been kind of middle of the road to something I didn't enjoy. However, I picked this up because of course I did. It's a modern adult romance that is retelling Beauty and the Beast put out by Disney. I loved the first book in this series. They're doing a whole series of these by different romance authors. I loved the Cinderella one by Julie Murphy. It was fantastic. So I went into this really hopeful because of course, book nerd that I am, you know, Beauty and the Beast was always my favorite Disney princess because 
like, I, I mean, I don't think this is an uncommon experience among the book community, but you know, I fell into that category. And uh, yeah, it was very long and boring. And I did not care about the romance. And I thought that some of the things that were supposed to be nods to Beauty and the Beast were way too on the nose. It, it, yeah, it just, it, it really didn't work for me. I liked the idea of it. Our Belle character is an assistant editor and she is tasked with getting this grumpy celebrity to finish the memoir he's contracted for. And of course, you know, the grumpy celebrity ends up being the Beast character. It was, it was very just okay. And that was disappointing. Man, this is gonna be a long video if I have this much to say about everything. Next is Little Eve by Catriona Ward. This is another one I think I read in a reading vlog at one point this year. I did not like this. It has a lot of graphic depictions of abuse of children, including sexual abuse of children, and I felt like a lot of it, including a lot of the twists, were done for shock value and were not treated with the care that they deserved. I do not like thrillers that use trauma in this way just as shock value when they're not handling it cautiously. I know that is not an uncommon thing to be done, which is probably why I'm picky about the thriller writers I like to read from, um, but this, I, I was not a fan. In fact, I had the exact same problem with the next book on this list, which is Dragonfly Summer by J.H. Moncrief. This is another adult thriller that has a very graphic scene of sexual assault on the page, and it uses sexual assault as well as incest for shock value and does not handle it well. Uh, I had some other issues with this as well, like plot holes, but just, I, I don't like this in thrillers. No, thank you. Then we have a book that has been quite polarizing in how people have responded to it. I was not a fan. This is Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. Listen, I enjoyed the love hypothesis. I thought it was fun for what it was, although the farther away from it I get, the more I see some of the flaws with it. And I think the more of Allie Hazelwood's writing I read, the more I realize that there were probably flaws in the love hypothesis that I breezed through the first time. I have now read everything that she has written and they are all exactly the same. <laughs> Look, they're all basically the same thing, which if you like what she does, maybe that will be fine for you. I don't love what it is that much. I am annoyed that every single guy is super duper tall and thin. And you know, it's I mean, it's all like Raylo fanfic, like everything is basically Raylo fanfic, but make it sciencey in modern day. Um, so all the dudes are like super tall and grumpy and thin. And all the heroines are really, really tiny and petite. And we hear about how petite they are and how big he is all the time. And it's really annoying. Um, and then on top of that, Love on the Brain in particular, there were a lot of things about it that I did not like just in terms of its portrayal of women in STEM. I didn't like the hero. He was horrible. And the things that he was doing for no real good reason were having a clear impact on a female colleague's career in the sciences where women are already underrepresented. So I just, I don't understand some of those choices. As a woman who works in the sciences, I don't know, I have a, I have a lot of problems with this. This video is gonna be really long as it is, so I'm not gonna get into all of the details. If you wanna hear more, check out my Goodreads review. My Goodreads is always linked down below, and I went into a little more detail of the things I found annoying about that book, but I was not a fan. Next up is White Ivy by Susie Yang. <laughs> this is funny because we actually read this for Patreon Book Club this year. It was the book that people voted on for our month to read a thriller. This book was marketed as a thriller and it's not a freaking thriller. <laughs> like, now, I don't know if that's the fault of the author. That might be a fault of the PR team, but this is not a thriller. It is a dark, slightly twisty, obviously twisty, slightly twisty, contemporary novel. This is another one where there were things about the project of this book and what it was trying to do that I liked and appreciated, but the actual execution of it didn't work for me. And that combined with the mismarketing, no, no. This was a big book club pick too. I think it sold really well. Two stars. It was, it was okay. <laughs> 
I don't know that anybody in book club loved it. Maybe there was one person who gave it like a four star, but most of us were like, what is this? This isn't a thriller. Why was this marketed to us as a thriller? It It's not. It's just like watching a car crash in slow motion. It's a woman making really stupid decisions that impact her life negatively. And that's the entire book. <laughs> anyway, that was an experience. Then we have In Every Generation by Kendara Blake. This is the first in what is going on to be a whole series of YA books set in the Buffy universe. Now listen, Joss Whedon is a horrible misogynist asshole and abusive and we don't like him. However, I still love Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I came to it more as an adult because I certainly wasn't allowed to watch it when I was growing up, but I really adore it. And I did not like this book. It made some real choices. And it was weird too, because there were certain things in the book that were fun at first, where you could tell that Kendara Blake herself is probably a big fan of the franchise. But then as a fan, you're gonna do what you did. <sighs> okay, here's the thing. So this is set in the future quite a ways in the future from the end of the Buffy television show. And one of the characters it's following is Willow's daughter. So Willow is now a mom, which it's fun to see that. But I don't like the choices in this book that are retroactively making Willow like bisexual or something. She's not. She is clearly a lesbian in the show. Like she is canonically a lesbian. She is an icon for that. And then you're gonna go and do what you're doing with this. I also don't like the way that the whole pregnancy piece of... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have some issues with this book. Again, you can check out my Goodreads review if you want to hear more. This is not going to be a whole Bumpy the Vampire Slayer rant, but no, no, what are you doing? I'm, yeah, that was disappointing. Next up, we have Talking Back to Purity Culture by Rachel Joy Welcher. So early in the year, I made a series of videos talking about books that I was reading through the process of deconstructing from being an evangelical, a former evangelical. And, uh, you know, those videos were really intense to make from an emotional and mental health standpoint, but I think were really valuable for a lot of people. So I'm glad there was a positive reaction to them. I intended to do another video in that series on purity culture. It never ended up happening, partly because I kind of needed to step away from my own mental health and my therapist was like, uh, you know, you don't have to do this. So this was a book that I read in preparation for making a video about purity culture and then I never made it. Maybe one day I'll return to that project and actually make one, but I just, it, it was, it was too much for me at the time. That said, I did not like this book. It presents itself as talking back to purity culture, showing the harm purity culture did and offering a new, better way to do things. It is not, <laughs> It's not that. It is mostly just purity culture repackaged for the modern day in a slightly more palatable form. Like there are a few good points that she makes in the book. Again, I'm gonna direct you to my Goodreads review if you wanna see the specifics. There are a few things that I wanna give her credit for for doing better than what purity culture did in the past. But for the most part, this is just purity culture all over again. Purity culture 2.0, if you will. And it fails to do anything really substantial to fix the problems and fix the harm that came through purity culture. One of the big issues with this, and there are many, again, Goodreads review, but one of the big issues with this is it, it keeps referring to same sex attracted people and like isn't overtly hateful about it, but also still holds to this clear line of like, you can't be queer and be with somebody who isn't a heterosexual partner and be a Christian. So yeah, it's not great. It's not, it's not a good book. Don't recommend it. I think there are better things out there. If you're looking for something in that vein that I think is really good, I would check out Hashtag Church 2 by Emily Joy Allison. That I think is a much better version of what this book says it's doing. Uh, okay, then we have a very disappointing adult fantasy debut from a YA author who I 
really have enjoyed her horror stuff. This is In a Garden Burning Gold by Rory Power. Ugh. This was a struggle to get through, y'all. I probably would have DNF'd it, but I got invited. <laughs> I got invited to be part of a focus group by the publisher, and so I finished it. And oh God, yeah, I would have. I would have 100% DNF'd this book if I hadn't been part of this focus group. But I finished it so that I could have a full discussion of it in the focus group. And y'all, they put us into breakup breakout groups on Zoom and nobody in my breakout group liked it. We all had negative things to say about it. And you could tell we all felt bad. We were like, it's too long. It's got plot holes. The characterization is not very good. It really reads like YA, not adult. This transition did not go smoothly at all. We see what she was trying to do and there are a few scenes that are really strong, but overall, no. Like, would I continue with the series? No. <laughs> yeah, this, this I would say is one of the less successful examples of YA authors trying to break into adults. And I think an example of somebody who doesn't really understand adult fantasy. So not all, and I, you know, I mean, like, to be fair, it's tricky because not only is she switching from YA to adult, she's also switching genres because she had written these short thriller horror books and now she's trying to do adult fantasy. That's a big leap and one that I don't think was managed successfully. It was a beautiful cover though. Lovely cover. Next is a novella. This is Rosebud by Paul Cornell. This was just really weird too weird for me. I think there are probably people who would appreciate this more, but it was not my brand of weird. It's a sci-fi novella about a crew <laughs> of beings, creatures, various things on a very, very tiny, tiny spaceship. Yeah, I don't know. This was just like, it was a very, it was very surrealist and it wasn't enjoyable for me to read. You know what? Like, I think there is a certain brand of surrealist science fiction that doesn't appeal to me. A great example of this, and this is a book that I always feel bad for not liking. I feel like I should like it because I like sci-fi, but truthfully I don't, is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Like, there is a kind of person who that hits for and they love it and then the humor works for them and the surreal sci-fi thing like it works i it's not i don't i like if i'm being honest i don't i would be like oh yeah sure because it's one of those things you're supposed to read and you're supposed to like i didn't actually enjoy reading it <laughs> so <laughs> um and this this is not humorous in the way that hitchhiker's guide is supposed to be but i feel like it's a similar degree of like weird surreal sci-fi that I, I just don't enjoy. But if that's your thing, you might love this. So who knows? Next on the list is Go Hunt Me by Kelly DeVos. Devo, De, I think DeVos. This is one where you can take my review with a grain of salt. There are reviewers who seem to have enjoyed this a lot more than I did. But I did not really like this book. Part of the problem is that it was presented as something it's not. I thought, based on the description, based on the marketing, that this was going to be a YA vampire horror novel, and it's not. There are no actual vampires. It is a non-paranormal YA horror novel following a group of filmmakers who go try to make a vampire horror film in Romania. The execution did not work for me, and there were a lot of things I found really annoying. You can kind of break this book into halves. The first half is like super slow plotting setup that I think is supposed to be building up this group of characters that are not well characterized anyway, so I don't know why we needed half the book to set them up. And then the second half is breakneck action that doesn't let up. <laughs> so it's a little strange. The teenagers in this book are really dumb, like really dumb. The things that they do, the choices they make are stupid and it feels like they're just stupid they're just making stupid choices not because the characters are supposed to be stupid but just for plot convenience the characters read more like caricatures than actual people so when things started going wrong i didn't really care all that much 
The twists I didn't find very surprising. And I think maybe this book was trying to say something about gender bias in the film industry, but given what it actually does and the way that the, the story goes, it doesn't end up saying anything meaningful about it. I don't know. I didn't like this book at all. And it's unfortunate because I think it had a lot of potential. It had some interesting set pieces. It's genuine horror that gets quite gory, which is not something you see all the time in YA. So I wanted to like it, but it just it did not did not work for me. So that was unfortunate. Next is a book that I read for a year long read along that me and Leanna at Leanna's library did. We did a read along of the sort of truth series. Uh, which, you know, both of us had read quite a few of the books in that series when we were a lot younger and enjoyed them, but had never continued on. And so we did a whole year of reading. And the books do get progressively worse, I would say. So the, the book I'm putting on this list is the worst of that reading experience. But if we're being honest, there were probably like three, at least three books that could have gone on the Source to the Year list. But we're gonna go with Naked Empire by Terry Goodkind. This is the book that got one and a half stars from me. I did not like it at all. I think the further we get into the series, the more Goodkind is just using the books as an opportunity to soapbox about stuff. And the less his characters resemble the characters they actually were at the beginning of the series. I stand by the fact that the first few books in the series are actually quite good, but they 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 get really bad. And Naked Empire, for me, was the worst of it. So yeah, unfortunate. I think I'm gonna, now that we've done this, I'm gonna unhaul up through a certain point in the series and just pretend that the rest of the books never happened. Moving right along to another book that is going to be a controversial pick. There are a lot of people who loved this book. I was not one of them. This is Anxious People by Frederick Backman. Mm, no, I didn't like this at all. One of the big things that I didn't like about this is it feels very emotionally manipulative. And you know, you could argue that to some extent, most books are manipulating your emotions. But this just felt egregious to me, like it's trying to make you feel specific things without actually putting in the work to thoughtfully address the big issues that it's dealing with. Like suicide, for instance, um, is, is one of the things that happens in this book. And I didn't like it. It felt icky to me. I didn't, I did not care for this book at all. And it has kind of put me off reading other things from Frederick Backman, which is unfortunate because I know there are people who love him and love what he writes. And I guess I get it because I, I suspect that his books probably make people cry a lot and there can be something cathartic about having a book that makes you cry. But personally, I don't like this version of that where I feel like the author is trying to manipulate me emotionally without really putting in the work and the character development and in treatment of these serious issues. Maybe his other books are better, but I was not a fan of this one. This is another one I did for a reading vlog and it's one that I'm going to read a, an excerpt of my Goodreads review because again it's been months and months since I actually read this one <laughs> so uh, my memory is not perfect. For about the first two-thirds of the book all the characters were incredibly annoying and depicted in over-the-top ways that didn't feel like real people at all. Then at the end the way they're written suddenly has humanity and nuance but it feels like an emotionally manipulative tactic to try to make the topics of the book grief, loss, loneliness, suicidal ideation, etc. hit harder. And I didn't like that. I said there were a lot of moments of faux deep philosophizing as if experiences the author I'm assuming has had are universal when they aren't actually universal experiences and trying too hard to be clever in ways that just didn't hit for me. I also felt like the ending wrapped up far too neatly and didn't reflect the messiness of humanity or the complexity of the world that we actually live in. Like it was trying to manipulate a sense of emotional catharsis from the reader. I was not a fan. So, oh, yikes. Yeah. Oh boy. There we go. All right. I think I need to change the battery on my camera. So we're going to do that. And then we'll continue with my seven worst books of 2022.
Next up, we have one that I had such high hopes for and it just kind of crashed and burned. This was set up to be a book I could have loved and y'all, it was not good. It has some real problems. This is Outlawed by Anna North. It was a book of the month pick. Somebody had reached out to me and sent it to me because they thought that I would like it. It's a post-apocalyptic Western that's set up to be sort of feminist and it was a no. This was not a hit for me. Um, again, Goodreads review. I started out liking this, but it has some real problems with the way it handles gender, sexuality, and race. I think the intentions may be good, but ultimately this could be more harmful than helpful. Whether or not it's intentional, it has some turfy elements to it. I think there are a lot of really great insightful reviews on Goodreads that are going into the details of what's wrong with this book. Again, I thought the idea was really cool. 1800s dystopian take on a Wild West story. It's like an alternate history where a virus post-Civil War killed off a lot of the population and now a somewhat different version of evangelical Christianity has created a patriarchy that reduces women's value to their ability to bear children. Okay, so that is kind of the focus. Our main character Ada is barren and because of that is treated as a witch and ends up running off to join a group of of cis women and genderqueer people who were assigned female at birth. And she becomes an outlaw along her, her way to hopefully become a doctor for women who studies fertility. Okay, so this is the, this is like the setup of, of the story. So here, here were some of my comments on some of the problems with this book specifically. This refuge that she runs away to is apparently only safe for women who are assigned female at birth, not for queer men or trans women. So again, it's got some of those turfy undertones to it. It does feel somewhat trans and exclusionary or like anti-men, anti-anybody who was assigned male at birth. Um, there's also a couple of instances that this book goes into details about people's genitalia that felt unnecessary and invasive. This includes when we're told that the kid is non-binary but then confirm that they were assigned female at birth by talking about their genitals. And then we get gruesome details about another character's situation after having been castrated for being a queer man. So like that felt intrusive and kind of icky to me, especially given the identity of the author who was writing it, who is not trans at all. Like I, mm, yeah, I had some real questions about that. Oh yeah, there's also a scene that makes it seem like it's okay for women to lure queer men into a sexual relationship by pretending to be men themselves in order to meet their own sexual needs as women. As if that's not super predatory against queer men. It's creepy, it's assault and predatory, and I didn't like that, and the book plays it off as if it's fine because they're men. <laughs> what the fuck? No. <laughs> this book also tries to address racism and miscegenation, which is the idea that people shouldn't be in an interracial relationship, but is pretty ineffective. There is a scene where the main character is rightfully taken to task by a black woman for endangering both of them while, quote, bravely standing up against racist ideas. So it's like a, a white person who, like, stood up against racism, but ended up putting themselves and this black woman in danger. The more I'm talking about this book, the more I'm remembering how bad it really was and how angry it made me. Like I remember reading, writing this review and just fuming at the problems with this book and the fact that it was being celebrated as this feminist masterpiece. And I'm like, who's feminism? Not my feminism. Okay, um, so, so this black woman is like, yeah, like you were trying to be brave, but like you're endangering both of our lives over something that you should have left alone. This wasn't your responsibility. Ada, this character, chews over the fact that she feels angry that this other character didn't appreciate her bravery on her behalf. But that's it. Like that's the end of it. So I said this was a missed opportunity to address white allyship that is really about centering themselves, but this author never actually follows through to do that. Similarly, we know indigenous women exist in this world, but the book never grapples with any of the issues pertaining to them. 
either or with the history of racism against indigenous people that exists in the Western genre. All of that is just like ignored, basically. Um, I said, ultimately, this is a book that is trying to do something kind of intersectional, but ends up just centering the white main character and spoiler alert, but her happy ending is her striking out on her own for her dreams after having taken advantage of the knowledge, skills, and resources of a more diverse community of women and genderqueer people. Um, yeah, it's a weird choice. It's super individualistic. It... Hmm. I said, uh, I was hoping the ending would be her in a community working with others to actually dismantle this harmful patriarchy, but no. No, it's just her off doing her dream. Yet yeah, this book, this book was not it. It was, it was not it. And you know, again, the more I'm reviewing this, the more I think this actually probably deserves to be higher or lower, I guess, on my list of worst books of the year than it is because like, talking about it is just pissing me off. So just imagine that this book is like closer to the, the, the lowest of my lows for the year, because it's one that the more you think about it, the worse it is. Yikes. Next is another one that we did for Patreon Book Club that was really disappointing, especially because it's from an author who I've loved in the past. This is The Book of Cold Cases by Simone St. James. <sighs> this was a bummer for me because I've really, really enjoyed previous books by Simone St. James, but I did not, I was not a fan of this book, and I particularly did not like some of the choices that were made with the twist ending. It just, I, I was like, come on, I expect better from you. I expect better treatment of women, better treatment of mental health issues. And like, I don't, this, mm, I can't talk too much about this without getting super spoilery. So I won't spoil the whole thing since this one is a thriller. I feel not so bad about spoiling the ending of Outlaw, to be honest, because it's not a thriller, but this is a thriller, so I'm not gonna spoil it. But I do have a spoilery Goodreads review where I get into the specific problems that I have with this book because <laughs> my biggest issues with this book are super spoilery, so I can't talk about them. I also did have some problems with like the pacing and <sighs> yeah. This book was frustrating, especially because I think she can do better. Granted, this was her COVID book and sometimes the COVID books aren't great and I, I hope we get better from her in the next one. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Oh man. Yeah, we're getting to some like some doozies, man. Next up, we have Primal Animals by Julia Lynn Rubin. Mm. Okay, so this is queer YA horror about a secret society, a dark secret society at a summer camp. <sighs> this book I did not like at all, and it was really rough to read. I'm going to use my Goodreads review again because I already wrote it. Oh my god, this book. Okay. Um, here are my pros for this. It certainly delivers on the horror and it does not flinch from grotesque and disturbing descriptions. That is accurate. If you're looking for that, maybe you'll like this. Personally, I want my horror to feel meaningful and like it's saying something. And this did not give me that. And that's what I was hoping for. Other pro queer representation, there is queer representation, including a sapphic romance and queer girls who are allowed to be messy and do bad things. Cool. I like that we're allowing that to happen. <laughs> That's the end of my pros list for this book. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, y'all, this was, <sighs> this was a lot. I guess spoiler warnings for this because I'm going to give you some content warnings of things that happen in specific scenes that I guess are kind of spoilery. So if this is a book you were planning to read, feel free to skip ahead. But I feel like you need to know like the what's in this. And this is YA. I, I will remind you this is YA. <laughs> YA horror. Okay. The horror elements are incredibly disturbing and involve things like harm done to animals, mutilation, gore, Things like consuming blood, both in forced and unforced ways. Like there's a girl forced to, co to consume someone else's blood. It was a lot to read and I'm left wondering 
what the point was. I think I've said before, I'm not a fan of disturbing content just for shock value if there's no reason behind it. I can do disturbing if you're trying to do something with it, if you're handling it well, if you're making a point. This was just, just disturbing for no apparent reason from what I could see. Um, like there is the ritual mutilation of a dead horse fetus. <sighs> okay, uh, forcing the main character to lick another girl's blood, having the main character covered in and consuming the viscera of a dead deer. Like, oh my god, I like that scene was so gross, gross. Uh, or severing a boy's head and attaching it to a stuffed sack. Good. <laughs> this is what I said in my review. What really was the point of this book? It's not feminist, it talks about sexual assault, but it doesn't handle it with any degree of care. It feels like a misandrist hellscape with the message that what? Murdering boys is bad, I guess? Like, is that the message of the book? I don't, like, I don't know what this book was trying to do. Um, I said I also just don't buy that this thing kind of thing could be so easily covered up or that it makes sense for her mom to have set, intentionally sent her to this camp knowing like what would happen there. So I didn't get the suspension of disbelief for the character motivations on top of all of that. Yeah, I said <laughs> it had some interesting ideas and moments of character interactions where I thought it would go in a better direction, but ultimately it just feels empty and without meaning to the disturbing scenes. There is a world in which this could have been smart and also brutal, but that is not the world we live in. Oh, mm. <sighs> y'all. Yeah, this was like gross. The mm. It was a lot. It was a lot. I didn't, I didn't like it. Okay. <laughs> Next. Next. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's another book that we read for Patreon book club. And I feel like this is uh, one of my biggest, this is one of my like most unpopular opinions in terms of my one star reads for the year. I did not like Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. And there are people who love it. Like it is some people's favorite book. I am so happy for you. I did not like this book. <clears throat> Again, we're gonna go to the Goodreads review and heads up that what I'm gonna say <sighs> technically is a spoiler for something that happens halfway through the book, but I think it's stupid that it's a spoiler. Like, I think this should have been in the book description. I think it, whatever, I, I have feelings about this, but some people are annoyed with me for not saying that it's a spoiler. So I'm gonna give you a spoiler for the middle of the book. Okay, Goodreads review. I don't get it. It's a less good version of The Martian, except with aliens. Yes, there's aliens. There's your spoiler. Aliens that Mark Watney, <coughs> I mean Ryland Grace, is able to communicate with through an absurd degree of simplicity. Okay, so first of all, like, I think this is basically the same character as the dude from The Martian. I enjoyed The Martian pretty well. I gave it four stars. I liked it pretty well. Uh, this character feels very much the same. But the commun- I, had, I, I hated the stupid communication thing with this new alien. Everybody loves the alien. They're like, it's the cutest thing. I love their relationship. And I'm like, no. Like, linguistically, it makes zero sense. The communication makes no sense. Thousands of shared words in only hours. He's not a linguist either. Compare this with the film Arrival, which did a much better job of approximating the difficulty of this kind of communication and the need for a specialist in linguistics, which we didn't have here. A shared understanding of mathematics and science that's amazingly similar to Western ideas. Like, oh, wow, amazing that they have like these shared understandings when there are other ways of thinking about like science. And anyway, the, there's that. Relatively minor differences in cultural norms, despite having completely different body structures. Add to the fact that it's a tonal language and this dude just happens to have perfect pitch. Like, I, like it's, it strains credibility to a degree that is absurd. And I think I'm especially annoyed about this because it's a book that tries to take itself so seriously in how it handles math and science in every other aspect of the book. But then when it comes to linguistics, we're like, eh, we're just gonna go off the deep end into complete unbelievability. I'm like, no, no. Let's not forget that this high school science teacher is not only a scientific prodigy and is apparently good at everything, he also apparently has perfect pitch, which, you know, we mentioned. Yeah, I, I just, I could not with this. 
I got interrupted in the middle of my Project Hail Mary rant with my kids getting home from school, but now they're out at the playground again with their dad. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Let's continue the end of this video. Uh, it is like cathartic, honestly, to get to, to vent about my frustration with all of these books. But I said, as far as the rest of the book, like alien linguistic stuff, aside. It may be fairly accurate in terms of math and science, but as a story, I just found it to be boring. I'm not here to read a textbook. I want an engaging story. For me, it did not give me that. I don't mind hard science. I can like hard science, but I need something else and this just wasn't working for me. And the alien didn't do it for me the way that it did for other readers from what I can tell. While I do think that this character is very similar to Watney from The Martian, I didn't find him as funny. The humor wasn't hitting for me in the way that it did in The Martian. And to be honest, the humor is a lot of what carried The Martian for me and made it fun. This just wasn't hitting, but humor is also really subjective. And so what does and doesn't work is gonna vary from person to person. I said, lastly, the narrative, and I had forgotten that this was even a criticism I had of the book, to be perfectly honest, but here you go. Lastly, the narrative choice to slowly reveal the past through magically chronological flashbacks felt incredibly contrived. And yes, the book does try to explain why it takes so long for him to get his memories back, but it feels like an obvious attempt to fill a plot hole rather than something believable. You know, to be honest, my reading experience with Project Hail Mary, I think, is a great example of how when you are enjoying a book, it's really easy to overlook flaws that don't bother you. And when you are not enjoying a book, all of those flaws stand out in stark contrast. And, you know, there are books that I really love that certainly have flaws, but I don't care about those flaws. I'm not bothered by those flaws because I am going along for the ride and enjoying the book. Project Hail Mary is a perfect example of a book that I was not enjoying. And because I already wasn't enjoying it, all the problems with it stood out to me like a sore thumb. This is also a book that I definitely would have DNF'd if it wasn't for the fact that it was a Patreon book club pick. That's why I pushed through it. I never would have, I, I don't know if I even would have picked this up at all, but I certainly would not have finished it if it wasn't that I needed to be able to competently lead a discussion for my patrons on it. So that's why I finished it. And you know, my star rating probably was lower by the end because I resented having to finish it because I wasn't having a good time. And I think my feelings were probably more negative toward this book as a result than they might have been if I could have just DNF'd it when it wasn't for me. And we are moving into my top three <laughs> worst books of 2022. The next one is uh, another one that's a big bestseller. It's Verity by Colleen Hoover. God, I hated this book so much. It's another one that I have a reading vlog for. I did that project where I was reading things that were popular on Book Talk, and I thought, you know, I don't think Colleen Hoover is an author that I'm gonna do well with, but who knows, maybe it will surprise me. I should at least give her a chance. So I picked Verity, which had already been on my TBR. That was a book that I had already thought I might enjoy. And then I let viewers suggest something else to me. And I also read It Ends With Us, which I think I read at the very end of 2021. So that's the only reason it's not on this list because I didn't like that either. I think it was on my worst of list for, for last year. But I did a reading vlog where I read those two books and I did not like them and I really hated Verity. I understand why her books are so popular. They're really like lifetime movies. They are high drama. They're page turners because they are written in this super easily digestible prose that you can just like slurp right up, right? So I think this is probably appealing, especially for people who aren't usually big readers and they pick up one of her books and they feel like they fly through it when normally you wouldn't. I That that is appealing. And I, I get that you enjoy the feeling of flying through a book. They are also books that are pretty emotionally manipulative. They deal with intentionally emotionally intense subject matter. And it's meant to bring up a lot of big feelings in the reader and create this kind of artificial sense of catharsis. 
And it's one of those things where I think for people who aren't necessarily thinking super hard about what they're reading and just want to breeze right through the book, they could get through it and be like, wow, that was a satisfying reading experience. But you don't want to look too hard at what you actually read or think too hard about what's actually on the page. Being who I am and being a reviewer, I couldn't do that. I couldn't like just ignore what was actually happening. And <laughs> did not like it. Verity was traumatizing for me, especially as a parent. There is a lot of graphic on-page child abuse in this book, and I was not expecting that at all. It was very, very disturbing for me to read, including abuse of infants. And I had a very hard time getting through it. I think the only reason I did is I was just listening to it on audio. I was doing it for a video project, so I did get through it. But I was not prepared for any of that content, and it was pretty horrific. I didn't like the ending. I thought it was stupid and didn't make sense. I had a lot of problems with this book. I'm not going to go into all the details, but if you want to check out my... <sighs> my reading vlog for this and it ends with us, I'll link it up above. I don't... I don't like it. No, like Colleen Hoover is not, not the author for me. And the fact that she is so wildly popular, just like, oh God, I don't know. I feel like her books are like lifetime movies and no shade if you enjoy her books and you want something where you can just like fly through it and turn your brain off. Like, that's fine. I have books like that. I have, I, I mean, and I think that's the reality. We all have things that we enjoy that we know have problems in them. Colleen Hoover is just not my version of that. And neither is my worst book of the year, <laughs> but it's, we'll get there. We have one more book, to, one more thing to talk about before we get there. So listen, y'all, for all of the other lists that I'm making, I am have not been including short stories just because they're not a full book. But for my worst of the year list, I'm including a short story because it was just, it was so bad. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pull up my Goodreads review. It was so bad that I gave it one star. This is The Garden by Tomi Adeyemi. <sighs> Y'all. So Amazon puts together these original collections of short stories by well-known authors. And they can be really fun sometimes. It's a cool way to get a little bit of extra content from your favorite authors. It can be a cool way to try new authors you've been meaning to read from. And sometimes the stories are really good. But this was not. Some of the other stories I've read in this collection are great. <sighs> okay, I'm just going to read you my Goodreads review. This was not good. I enjoy these short story collections Amazon puts together by different authors and the Into the Shadow collection has a couple of my favorites. I There were some really good ones that I read by Nevo, by Alexi Harrow, and yeah, like there are some good ones. But The Garden was a rough start to the collection. I believe this is Adeyemi's first foray into writing for adults, but it feels very amateurish. Each chapter begins with very bad poetry. <laughs> very bad poetry. And the entire story is a woman traveling in Brazil with a guide to a mythical garden mentioned in her mother's possibly cursed journal. That sounds like it should be really interesting, but it's not. In practice, it's not. And I think this is unfortunate because it's one of those things where the premise is good and it had so much potential, but the execution was not great. We never see this garden just her going on the trip. She says that the journal is cursed, but we don't know why or whether it actually is. We don't know. She's also not a great traveler. She's freaking out about the drinking water with local ice in it. She's grossed out by the local food. And she's flirting with her guide, her Brazilian guide, which, which feels weird to read. <laughs> which feels really weird to read. Uh, it I said it reminds me of the cringiness of when I was traveling in college with girls who would flirt with the local boys because they were exotic. That was the vibes that this short story was giving me and I was like, hmm, okay. The prose is trying very hard to be emotionally evocative, but just feels maudlin. It just feels like overly soppy and emotional. The story waxes poetic about believing in curses, 
but it like it did nothing for me and if I'm being honest I had some very strong secondhand embarrassment from the poetry being so bad. Also the poetry felt like it was padding out the story. It's a very very short story as it is and then at the beginning of each little interlude or chapter or whatever you're adding all of this poetry. I don't know. It was y'all. It was, it was not good. I don't know what happened there. Um, yikes. And lastly we have come to my number one spot. My <laughs> worst book of the year. I, I waffled a little about which book to put in this spot, but I think this this is this takes it, man. Uh, the worst book that I read in 2022, I did a reading vlog for and I read it for my podcast, Chapter 3 podcast, because me and Izzy from Happy For Now were like, hey, wouldn't it be fun to like pick a book that sounds interesting, that's really popular on Book Talk and like read it and do an episode on it? Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So we decided to read the first Zodiac Academy book. Oh my god, it's so bad. It's so bad. Oh man, people love it though. People freaking love this series. It has made so much money for those sisters who sell it. And listen, again, I get it. I feel like this is for some people is definitely a popcorn read. It's the kind of thing that they just want to like gobble up and not think too hard about. And that's fine. But like, oh my god, it's, oh, it's so bad. Um, so this is <laughs> I'm like, why did I read this book? It's awful. And and then people are coming into my comment section of that vlog telling me, well, you just, you know, like it gets really good in the like the fourth book in the series. I am not freaking reading four books into this series hoping it gets better. Are you kidding me? Like what? No, no, <laughs> that was plenty for me. I am done. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is about two twin sisters who are basically the same person. Like the, technically there's two perspectives, but can you tell the difference between the perspectives? No, not at all. Like they narratively read exactly the same. Their hair is different. And one of them likes motorcycles. Like that's all I could tell you about how they're different. Uh, <laughs> they read like the same person. Anyway, it follows two twin sisters who are orphans and they turn 18 and then find out that secretly their parents were fey royalty and they have to go to this magical school, which I was like, cool. I like magical schools. This sounds like fun. Listen, y'all, this, th this book does what I like to call everything in the kitchen sink world building, which is like more is better if we put every possible fantastical thing that we can think of and throw it all together without worrying too much about whether it makes any sense, that's better. So we're gonna have vampires and unicorns and goblins and <sighs> magic and the zodiac and tarot and like all the things. Like if there's a thing that is like semi magical or or semi speculative that you can imagine, it's probably in this book. Is it explained? No. Does it all make sense? Also no, but it's there. So cool. Um, so we have these two girls who go to this school and this is a bully romance. Now listen, I had never read a bully romance before Zodiac Academy nor do I intend to ever read a bully romance again because I don't understand it. Uh, why, pray tell, <laughs> would you have feelings for somebody who is cruel to you? Like, not just kind of a jerk, but like cruel and abusive. Oh, but I can't help that I have all these sexual feelings around this person who is literally cruel and abusive. Like, what? What? <laughs> uh, my uh, semi-demisexual self does not understand. No, no, I don't. I don't get it, y'all. What the, what the actual fuck? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't get it. 
Um, so yeah, so basically like, I think each girl has like three love interests that are all awful, pretty much. Oh, but one of them is a professor. So we have that too. Um, it's technically okay because they're 18 and it's more of like a college, but it's still not okay because power dynamics, yuck. It, mm. <sighs> Could I differentiate between the five non-professorial love interests? Also, no. <laughs> like, did they have distinct personalities? Not really. I think one of them has a girlfriend who's also a jerk. Also, all the girls hate each other. So there's that. Like, we have girl hate. We've got uh, abusive, bullying, cruel love interests. And then a professor love interest who's a creep. And no. Uh, the dialogue is also really bad. <laughs> and there's a character who's Latinx who... who is like throws random Spanish words into his language like into his speaking when it doesn't make any sense and I'm like no one talks like that what is this this book is absurd absurd now listen like if you enjoy it like oh my god I just I hated it so much but it is so absurd. But there are people who love this series. There's like eight or nine of books in the series and people and then there's spinoff series. It is it's a lot. Anyway, people love them. I don't get it. I no, it is not for me. It is really, really, really not for me. So again, if you want to hear like some of the specifics of the dialogue, check out the reading vlog I made. But Oh my gosh. Um, <clears throat> Izzy also thought it was bad, but said that she could see herself returning to read it as like a popcorn read at some point in the future. I will not do that, but she might. But, and this is where I'm saying like, we like different things and that's totally fine. But this was my worst book of 2022, y'all. What did I read? This is gonna be a long one to edit because I guess I had a lot of big feelings, but this was kind of fun and cathartic and hopefully you enjoyed it. <laughs> like a roundup of all of my hot takes on the worst books that I read in 2022. I read a lot of amazing books. Even a decent chunk of the books on this list, it's not that I think that they are objectively horrible, but they were really not my thing. So take it as you will. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know what were some of your worst books that you read in 2022. I promise if you hated some of my favorites, I won't take it personally. I have seen some of my favorite books on other people's worst of the year list. So I get how it feels. It is what it is, you know, like we're gonna like different things. It's fine. Talk to me in the comments down below if you guys like this video. It always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.